This episode of the Managing Madrid podcast is brought to you by Manscaped. Head over to manscaped.com and use code Managing Madrid for 20% off and free shipping. That's code Mans- That's code Managing Madrid over on manscaped.com. I'm a little excited about Real Madrid's win over Athletic. I'm slurring my words. And I did want to give out the Manscaped Man of the Match Award, which goes to the player who undoubtedly Manscaped the most before the match started. And today, Congratulations to Rodrigo Goish. He manscaped everything and everything with the code managing Madrid over manscaped.com. Had a terrific performance. Congratulations, Rodrigo, for winning the Manscaped Man of the Match Award against Athletic Club at home. Listeners, if you want to get 20% off and free shipping, head over to manscaped.com and use code managing Madrid. That's manscaped.com and use code managing Madrid for 20% off and free shipping. Nice article in the Managing Madrid uh, blog. Uh, wonderful lads that do a great job there. And uh, worth reading about that man there. So he bet the man needs to rest and the numbers reveal why. Time's ended up almost looking like a 6 3 1. Some very good writing about that on the Managing Madrid website. Such great podcast as well. Pere Valverde was a huge part of the equation. All right, we are recording this a few minutes after the final whistle at the Santiago Bernabeu. Sam Leverage was on site for Managing Madrid. He has headed down to the press conferences now. We will wait to hear back. Managing Madrid will tweet out Ancelotti's quotes as they come. We'll deal with them. This is Kian Savani. We got Jose Perez on. We got Sid Hartram Sundar on. This is the trio that recorded on Friday the athletic preview that went into this entire ta- tangent of Manchester City previewing. And oh, God, what else did we talk about? Chabi Alonso. And guys, I don't know. Like, what is the point of our previews, actually? Everything we talk about just goes out the window. Nico Williams, this. Guy who's on fire this season didn't play. Athletic, I don't know what was going on with them. They did not play well at all. We had a very comfortable Sunday evening, which is how I like it. I don't think it was a masterclass, but I think it was quite comfortable. I don't know if we got out of first gear. I'm fine with it. And I have little to no doubt that Sid really is only here to talk about Man City Arsenal. (laughs) That was uh, earlier in the morning. Uh, We'll talk about that too, I'm sure. Um, Why don't we talk... Let me start with you, Jose. Wait, this is, wait, this is about the Bilbao post game. I thought this was the <laughs> wrong podcast. You're in the wrong place, bro. Jose, is this what you were expecting? Um, I was expecting a bit more from Athletic in the attack. In attack, uh, it was more or less about as hard as I would have expected. Like it was a bit hard for us to break them down, and that's pretty much what I expected. Um, yeah, but yeah, in attack, of course, the absence of Nico Williams makes it made them have a bit less firepower in attack, and it does give you a feeling, even though the Copa final is a week away, it does give a feeling like they were thinking a bit more about that than about this game. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, that's what I got the vibe with Nico too, and I, I just a note on Nico when he missed the game, I'm like. You know, Vinny missing is a big absence, but relative to the players they have on their team, Nico's an even bigger absence for Bilbao and what they can offer than Vinny is to Madrid. Because we still have Brahim, Rodrigo, Jude, like top players. They don't really have anyone close to Nico. So that was a real shot in the foot for them. Jose, I saw your tweet about trying to get over how boring the City are. I'm paraphrasing how boring the City Arsenal game was. And then you tuning into this and looking at the XG at halftime and that it wasn't much better. I would argue this was infinitely more entertaining than the City Arsenal game. But I don't know. Maybe we're not smart enough, guys. Did you guys see the chess match? Did you see the chess pieces all that were moving around? Arteta sitting there with the chess board. He was, he was drawing it out. What a master class. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, I was, I was I loving that. I think Arsenal, the thing yeah. I learned about today was, was much more entertaining. Um did you pick up on anything like tactically today from either teams that intrigued you to start off the conversation? Um, I know Jose, you had some thoughts about the Chu Many role and how you like Kamavinga in that role specifically a little bit better. Do you, do you want to start there? Yes. So 
One of the things that I've been noticing since the Celta game and it carried over to Osasuna and it's carrying over here is that the teams... So kind of the tactical story for Real Madrid this season is, okay, they start the season against Athletic with the 4-4-2 diamond. Then the thing cha- switches over to kind of a flat 4-4-2. And then at some point, I think against Hitafe at the end of January... Uh, Angelotti started trying this more of a 4-3-3 kind of setup and the wingers were a bit more wide open. And the last three games, Celtos, Asuna, and now against Athletic, it looks like the team is changing back to a sort of flat 4-4-2, which is what we've been seeing lately. Today, it was, it, it was a setup that definitely defended in a flat 4-4-2, which personally, like, and this is an observation that applies to every season under Ancelotti, I think Real Madrid defends better with Ancelotti when they defend in a 4-4-2 rather than a 4-3-3. The defense tends to be messier in the 4-3-3, so it's just they can keep a compact block better in the 4-4-2. Um, and then what we've been seeing... Um, and then before in previous games, maybe you had something more as like a single pivot that could have been Kroos, could have been Tramani, sometimes even Camavinga. Right now we're seeing a more clearly defined kind of double pivot. Uh, with Cel- Against Celta, it was Camavinga and Modric. Against Osasuna, it was Camavinga and Kroos. And this time it's Tramani and Kroos. So now we're seeing a more well-defined double pivot, which I think helps bring... Uh, which I think works quite nicely. I like it. It allows Kroos to be more in contact with the ball. While all, like In a way, for example, against Osasuna, it felt like Amavinga and Kroos were not interfering with, with each other, which is something that happened in, pro, in past setups. So I like that a lot, and that's why it had some of my favorite Camavinga performances this season. This time around with Tramini, of course, Tramini doesn't have the same kind of line-breaking capability that uh, Camavinga has so and against the team that presses and defends a bit more aggressively like Athletic eh, you kind of miss Camavinga's line breaking uh but of course there's also there are also defensive advantages of having Tramini there so all in all it's still a very a, a very balanced double pivot even if it's maybe not as exciting in on the ball as it would be if you had Camavinga there but that's my main observation tactically about the team for the last three games or so Speaking of Kamavinga and line breaking, that play he had off the bench late was unbelievable. And I wish the only reason I'm not playing it here is because YouTube would give us the the, the copyright strike. But I'm sure everyone knows what I'm talking about. It was an incredible feat to see him dribble the ball and maneuver in such a tight space. I think the double pivot is interesting because I think all of our players are suited in different combinations. It'll it'll work like regardless of what the combination is. And I think maybe what surprised me to an extent, and it shouldn't be that surprising, but it was kind of to me just because of this. Any combination of double pivot with Cruz has worked this season. Um, and he defensively, again, was great today. And it looks good defensively. It looked good when it was Fetty and Cruz to double pivot. And I think part of it is that while Cruz is just a really intelligent player behind the ball when it comes to playing defense, and but sometimes he just surprises us with his defense a little bit. And he was really great defensively too. And I think with the two many Cruz double pivot today, with Fetty playing a little bit higher on the right um, alongside them, it was kind of basically two many Cruz, and then you had. Fede and Ju just ahead of them a little bit. And then you had Rodrigo and Brahim. And I think it wasn't this beautiful orchestra offensively, to be fair. But they control Athletic very well, especially in the first half defensively. With those two just knowing where to be, they intercepted some nice passes, had some great challenges. Rudiger at the back was phenomenal again. And, and Fede and Jude also helping to drop defensively. I just think like, Maybe my, maybe, I don't know, some Real Madrid fans maybe have a higher expectation than me, and that's fair. I just thought, given all things considered, this is one of the best teams in the league we're facing, albeit uh, without their best player. It's also the first game after the international break, which can be a bit of a banana peel. I thought we, we played really well. 
Um, I'm fine with it being relatively uneventful and relatively boring and not this absolute tsunami and a manita. I thought we were in first gear for most of the game. We were comfortable. We limited Athletic to virtually zero. So one or two times we did let them in. Lunin came up big. And it also could have been easily three or four nil, I thought. So that's my take. Um, Sid, what, what did you think? I'm just proud of Nacho. 90 minutes, no mistakes. Good work. Uh, he had one, I thought. He had one the first half where he gave the ball away. That's the one I can, there was one that I can think of. Well, not, I guess, no, no big defensive errors where he didn't no jump. No cost. Ball. Yeah. Um, and Militao coming back was just a great sight to see if there's even a shot of him playing against Man City. I mean, there's a chance now. This is what we wanted. We wanted to be up 2 0. I'm glad we got that out of the way. Um, Ibrahim was fun. Rodrigo, I'm really happy for him. Florentino, the the whole getting a shirt thing worked. Whatever whatever other black magic they're running at the Bernabeu at this time of the year, they always run it every year, and it was it was great to see. Like that, there wasn't a more perfect start to the game. Perfect goal scorer, given what we need, and um, I'm happy. I'm I'm just really happy, satisfied. It was pretty boring though. Man, I was so hyped for this Sunday, Super Sunday, and like. That was, that was those were two slow games for sure. I mean, I, I can watch one like game with not too many chances, two in a row back to back. I'm like, hot oh, damn it. Um, so I, I felt that Jose. I mean, we were promised a great Sunday, didn't didn't fully live up to it. Our game was, I'd say, what I want though. Uh, this is all I cared about from our game. It's just um, we only created 1.1 expected goals. We weren't some juggernaut offensively, so yeah, that's worth noting. But I mean, when when you score a long shot in the third minute, what are we gonna do? Go like try and destroy them? I guess not. Um, not this team, at least. They're still like, they're still decent. You know, they they can't be. We couldn't run them over, which I thought was telling. We just um, dominated the territory. <clears throat> Jose, we need to know what you're drinking. Can we get some insight on that? Oh, the drip, the the red drink here. It's rather artificial. It's like you put. It's a bit like you have like a bit of uh, sparkling water that you add some kind of like syrup, and then it tu it turns into some kind of fruity soda. No, oh, okay. I I thought it was gonna be tea, and I was just curious because my dad. Oh. So that's an ice cold glass drink, right? Like you usually put cold drinks yeah. in it. My dad uses that exact same cup, and he just pours it with tea, and he drinks it like that. Mm. And I was super excited that I was gonna, I was gonna tell my dad that you do the same thing. I love um, another tea drinker, but nah, I'm not, I'm not that much of a tea drinker lately. But sometimes. I thought it was a beer or something, but I'm like, why would you pour it out into the glass, fancy, instead of just drinking from the can? <laughs> hmm. Sid, I guess maybe not. Maybe you poured it out. Sid, uh, you were outside yesterday. And the day before that for your podcast and you're back inside yeah there was just a couple of droplets of water and my last laptop went went to went to hell because of the moisture on it and as soon as i saw a couple of droplets i had to come inside it's a yeah. damn shame chicago weather not great today yeah. all right back yeah. to the game. um so <clears throat> i mean I, I i i was i was gonna bring up the xg map i i and, and share it i got a little bit distracted um one of those games where I thought there wasn't like that much to really pick up on. And I don't know if it was because athletic were just super disappointing and didn't threaten us at all. Or again, us just kind of going through the motions. Like it was weird. Like at halftime, there was almost this consensus that we were just really comfortable and not even playing that particularly well, but really not being threatened and just kind of passing it around. Was there anything else that you guys like picked up on that first half that was interesting to you? <laughs> I will say this. Let me say this because I, I I think the answer to that question is probably no. But let me say this. Uh, one thing that I thought was kind of interesting was that Athletic were in this four four two kind of mid block, and the front two, and um, basically the way they had it set up was they would try to limit the amount of touches that Cruz and Chu many were getting because everyone knows that Cruz and Chu many are the most integral players in this particular lineup in the build-up phase because they're both the, the ball progressors by a passing and they were trying to cut off the supply to those two 
And I think what essentially happened on the Rodrigo first goal was that they tried to take Cruz and Chiumeni out of the game. We worked it around them. And then after that, we were just in open water. Like there was just a ton of open, open water to go through. And Brahim makes this great switch. Rodrigo gets it and he cuts in and he shoots. And I think that takes us in like the natural discourse of Rodrigo, who had a great game. Sid, you mentioned the the black magic. I think we can like if we have a successful season by the end of it, we can go back and talk about the pivotal turning point of Florentino asking Rodrigo for the shirt. For now, not to get ahead of ourselves, he looked great today. Um, also, nearly had an assist with a really great pass to Brahim, who hits the post. Is it a position thing? Is it a mental thing? What what do you think it is with him? I do think it's mental. I think um I mean I think he dribbles well almost every position. That's where like his progression is fine from the right wing. It's it's pretty good from every position, but um he's not always decisive shooting and we've seen this with other people who have shaky finishing sometimes. They just doubt themselves when they're going to shoot. Maybe they take too many dribbles. He sometimes has that Vinny thing or he takes too many touches in the box. So, I think it's all mental with him and if he can just get a shot off faster, a little stronger, he's he's a deadly player. So we saw that today. Um, obviously, it's just one game and we've seen him score braces before, but I do think it's very mental. What about you, Jose? Yeah, I would kind of agree with that. Like, And this is, and this is also a debate where like both things can be true at the same time. It's like, yes, it is true that Rodrigo's best position is still left wing. That doesn't mean that his performance in the other positions hasn't been underwhelming. It has. Like, you still, yes, I expect Rodrigo on the left to be better than Rodrigo in the center or on the right, but he still hasn't given the output that you would expect him from those positions. And also, uh, and also, a lot of the time, I mean, the issue has also been finishing. So it doesn't matter whether he's coming left or right. He gets in the box and then he did it. He, he didn't get the chance. And that's that's not really a left or right problem. That's just a finishing and output and mentality problem, like like Sid says. So if, it is a bit of everything, of course. If you want, it makes sense that if you want Rodrigo to recover, like Rod- Rodrigo has been fairly streaky this season, and it is it make and it does make sense that if you want to recover his best form and get him out of a bad streak. It does make sense that you might want to put him on the left because it might be easier for him to recover his confidence from that position. But I do think that a good Rodrigo can contribute from left or from left or right. And the issue isn't necessarily hasn't necessarily been Rodrigo playing left or right. It's just been more confidence, his output. Like I think Rodrigo had for even carrying since last season, like he had ca- carried finishing issues that at the beginning of this season really started getting into him and then affecting the confidence he was playing with. Because last year he was not getting the shots in, but he was still playing with confidence. And then this year, he, like his confidence really took a bigger hit. And then his play, like, like the way he was contributing in possession, passing and everything just looked uh, also looked a bit off. So, and to me, again, that's something that's regardless of the position. And also, I mean, Rodrigo's best output in a game this season has been playing off the right against Valencia, where he had like two goals and two assists, I think. So, again, the best Rodrigo can contribute from everywhere. He will contribute more from the left. It is his best position, but he can do better than what we've seen this this season, regardless of position. This is where I stand too. Uh, I think it was on, uh, it wasn't even on our podcast. I think it was on Faisal's podcast when I was on it, where like I had a whole thing that I don't think the Rodrigo thing is a position problem. I think it's uh, it's a confidence problem. And I know today is a terrible um, day for that case because, you know, saying that after today where he scored two goals, playing in his, on the left wing is obviously a, a great counter argument to what I'm saying and what we're saying. But I think, think I'm thinking back. I'm not thinking about this game in isolation not necessarily. I'm thinking about when we've seen Rodrigo at his best and where he functions the best alongside his teammates. 
he himself has talking about how he likes to play down the middle the most, even more like we, we kind of force this left wing thing on him. He says he, he, he likes playing down the middle the most. He's had some absolute master classes down the middle. I think when he is at his best, it's when him and Vinny are playing off each other and dragging defenders around, creating space for each other, linking up together, excuse me, or when he kind of floats around and he's floating around as a 10. I think that's when he's at his best. And I think today in large part, you know, if you look at both of his goals, they were in transition and he took them beautifully, both of them. There was a little bit more space to work with on, on those two sequences at least. I think with him, it's more of a confidence thing rather than a position thing. And the point I made on that podcast was like, look, you're not always going to be coddled to and given your best position. Like it just doesn't work like that. Right. Unless you're the absolute A-list alpha superstar where the team caters around you, you're just not going to go and get your perfect role everywhere. Everyone wants their best position. Everyone wants to play either as a 10, a floating, you know, a floating midfielder where you can link up and do whatever you want. It's just really hard to always get what you want in football at this level. And I, the reality is whether he likes it or we like it or not, it's not going to be possible for Rodrigo to play this position consistently. We know why. So he's going to have to adapt. And quite frankly, I think he, he can adapt. And he has already shown he can adapt that in the last few years. He can play centrally. He can feed off of whoever's on the left wing. And obviously, he can also play left wing. So I, I just don't think it's a position thing with him. I, I think it's more of a, a confidence thing. And, and hopefully, he picks it up. Uh, and certainly, he picked it up today. Uh, awesome. All right. So we spoke about kind of the defense, the offense. I don't know. Did you guys notice like a, a change in the second half at all in terms of the way we approached it? Not really. Like, I think it was a fairly, it was a game where really both sides were kind of comfortable with the status quo in in some ways, even though Atletic were losing. Like, cause it, it looks like they were more looking forward to the Copa final than after. And, and then, of course, I think the goal, the early goal from Rodrigo changes a bit the game state for Madrid. Like, it's just, they go at it with... Uh, kind of a, a, a in first gear during the first half because okay the goals there they don't need uh the the team doesn't really need to speed up or really put put the foot to the pedal there so it didn't feel like the team was doing anything particularly particularly different athletic wasn't doing anything particularly different so rather so very samey second half i would say we got that brahim chance early in the second half um, when he hit the post, I thought he was pretty lively throughout, but I thought in the second half, maybe a couple of our moves, it wasn't that many, but like two, three of our moves led to chances that we didn't really do in the first half at all. And one of them was the goal. One of them was the Brahim chance. Um, I thought that was the main difference. Just a little, little more chance creation, a little more efficiency, but not much change in approach. No. Um, yeah, it was, I was surprised. I mean, people were making fun of Bilbao saying like, you know, Bilbao or to Atletico, like what Atletico Madrid are when they play Barcelona is what Bilbao are when they play us. But I don't agree that, like, they've been intense. It's just maybe this year, though, we did swat them aside at two easy games. And I think all the other big teams have had problems with them. So, well, I, I saw uh, our our sister site, Into the Calderon, put up a meme Athletic versus us versus Athletic versus Real Madrid. And it's, you know, the whole thing where they kind of cower to, uh, against us. And I'm like, guys, I, you know, no one's going to start Twitter beef with them. But guys, like, come on. You, you're, you can't, you are the ultimate, you know, bend over for Barca guys. We're not going to, we're not going to, we're not going to entertain this right now with you guys. What do you, was Fede hurt? I really like zoned out the last 15, 20. Th those were honestly the most sleepy. Of Look more like a knock than, okay. uh, than a proper injury. So I, or at least that's what I would hope. Yeah, I didn't I see it. Did you see it, Keon, as, as well? I, I saw it. I just didn't know how serious it was. And I was just hoping that we would get a quote from Ancelotti after the game clearing up. Um, so I don't know. I really don't know. I, I I kind of got the sense that the same one that Jose had in terms of um now nah, I, I I gotta go over Ancelotti's quotes in a second here, but 
Uh, I don't know. I don't know. We'll go. We'll go. We'll oh yeah, go. he just said he said it's a knock. He'll wear it off. Um, he also said that Jude and Fede were worn out because of international break. That's something I noticed. Like early, Jude felt a little a touch slow at times, especially the first fifteen minutes. I thought he was just um, didn't feel like himself. But yeah, I mean that's what you get when you fly to a different time zone and, or whatever. I mean, I guess Jude was still only in England, but that's what you get when. I mean, they were all in Europe, but still intense international games. So he was a little jaded. But yeah, let's go through the quotes. He hasn't said anything interesting. Like they asked him about Pep's quotes about the schedule. You saw Pep's quotes, I'm sure, right? About uh, Madrid having nine days and City's grueling schedule. And actually, like he's not wrong, but like what does he want? Like this is just the way it shook out this year. Last year, um, I think we had like a Copa final like a few days before City. Like, it, you know, every year it's just going to be different. It's the luck of the draw. I don't know what what you want um it's classic pep discourse it's just like oh everything is so hard for everything is so hard for us even though <laughs> we have probably like the bit like the bit like the biggest nicest squad in the world so yeah jose pour one out for for pep pour one out use your your iced tea artificial iced tea to pour one out for pep poor guy life is so tough with this guy man oh man I feel so bad for him. um Let's look at uh, Mark. what Mark Sachs bot says, and then we'll take a super chat, and then maybe we'll go over some more quotes. Um, let's see here. All right. Our favorite Twitter account, Mark Sachs bot, the only good bot on the entire app. Um, expected goals, 1.12, not that high, but you can see athletics, virtually nothing. Uh, more possession. Less expected threat. The field tilt also in Athletics' favor. That kind of surprises me a little bit. Um, let's go through some of the charts. So Real Madrid is the blue line, and you can kind of see the discrepancy between them and Athletic, and then the expected threat. I guess it kind of peaked later in the game for Athletic. That's why maybe it was skewed. I don't. I don't remember really what happened in that situation. Here are the pass maps. Anything that. Catches your eye. Athletics is kind of wonky here. I don't know what's going on here. You guys feel free to jump in whenever you want. <clears throat> um, and you can see the best ball progressors. So no really, no one really jumping out top, right? Sometimes there is. Rodrigo really hurt them through ball carrying. Jude Bellingham as well. And Rudiger and Cruz were passing the hell out of it progressively, vertically. Yeah, it makes sense. So there are certain situations where... Uh, like it it wasn't that easy to get through athletic but whenever they did like for example bellingham and rodrigo had a lot of room to run and that's and that's one of the uh, like one of the things the team tried to take advantage of uh, i think the well the play of the second goal kind of comes from a sequence like that where like uh bellingham gets the ball like behind the pre behind the press and then he has plenty of room uh to run and assist so um so it's not like the team found a way to consistently get through athletic, but every time they did, they could do damage. Then looking at the passing network, it did like when you were when I was watching that, it gave the did give the impression of kind of a four two two two. So with Fede and Bellingham like a bit ahead of the double pivot, and it kind of shows it. And the passing network definitely shows that. Definitely shows that with Rodrigo a bit more out wide in a similar way to how. Vini would be if he were playing off the left. I think this is. Uh, I was uh, earlier in the season. I was very much of uh, of the opinion that I preferred this kind of four four two or four two 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 setup instead of instead of the four three three or the diamond that Ancelotti had been using. So I am kind of happy that going into the city game, it seems like this will be the setup that we'll use. Right on cue, said this is right up your alley because I know I know you you're you're really here to talk about Manchester City. Well, so the managing with your Twitter account is tweeting out Ancelotti's post game quotes, and one of them, I mean, he, he was asked about too many or Nacho versus City. He said we'll evaluate that. Um, the one that stood out to me is Ancelotti said we watched the City game today. We will study and evaluate everything. We will prepare it perfectly. Perfectly, Sid. 
Okay. Getting us excited, Carlo. Yep. That's what I like to hear, Carlo. I mean, yeah, I mean, let's talk about that. That was um, a master class. Now we have a game where Liverpool showed us how to attack them. Arsenal showed us how to defend them. I think we have both we've seen in the last month. Um, that was one of the great... I mean, I know it was boring. Like, I don't know. I just think... It, I, I know a lot of people said it was boring, and I won't disagree. But just watching Arsenal like cut out those bullshit little Rodri runs advanced. It was so good. Like Rodri, every time he got there, three guys surrounding him and everyone was tweeting. There were, I saw these stupid tweets. They're like, oh, we know how this game ends. Rodri gets a long shot, deflect, it goes in. But he didn't get an inch of space. And I love that. I loved watching Declan Rice, Hound, De Bruyne. Um, I, I just loved how they defended them. Like, yes, they couldn't attack. But I mean, come on, like we have Vinicius and they have Gabriel Jesus. There's a big difference. Like, um, you know, Jesus, no disrespect to him. But Vinicius is a better attacker than anyone on their team. I was hoping Saka could do more, but he was on an island too much. Couldn't add much offensively. But we have better attackers and we have the midfield to play such a high intensity game. And they had Jorginho in there for a lot of it. And they defended well. Like not someone, I guess Tuchel's done it before, but I guess Tuchel has beaten City with Jorginho in his midfield. But not someone I'd expect to dominate um, defensively. And they did well defensively. I love the block. Um, it was hard work, though. Their whole team defended for sure. Like every single guy was back, like crunched up. It was a very defensive game. I just thought it was like really a masterclass defensively. I don't know what else to say. Like they, like City barely created anything. Haaland, like he was getting made fun of because he didn't get on the ball. Like, you know, you know, it's bad when Haaland gets made fun of. Um, once they had Doku and Grealish on, I thought they dealt some damage. Um, City looked a lot better. So that is a factor to consider. Also, Nathan Ake went off injured. That's a big factor. I just thought, like, everything considered, they're now three points off Liverpool. Um, they're a point off Arsenal. So they're not top. They're not going to be top of the table when they play us, which is how it's always been. And, you know, Pep's probably going to be even more salty in three days, like, at this rate. Um, wh what do you think, Jose? Like, I thought that was, a, like, I think in terms of how to set up a block, that's how you do it. Get the wingers tracking, funnel the ball out wide to... Um, Guardiola was good, but funnel it to Guardiola and Akanji. That's how we got to play. Yeah, I mean the what Arsenal was trying to do in the like, especially at the beginning of the game. So the so I think when I was tuning out a bit more was at the beginning of the game where it was a bit of Arsenal playing deeper, uh, and it looked like the strategy was a bit well. It's what you mentioned, right? Let uh, let City go out wide, send it out to the fullbacks. Those are probably the least dangerous players from City that we're gonna, that we're going to have to worry about. So, and that seemed to be intention, the, the, the intention with Arsenal, like clog up the central lanes, force City to go out wide, and especially try to force uh, the fullbacks to do some kind of delivery into the into the box. And that, it, it, and it looks like Arsenal was quite comfortable controlling those situations. And then they were fairly uh, opportunistic about the pressing that like, then there would be moments like in the second part of the first half, then they started to get a bit more aggressive, a bit more pressing, and then try to get, uh, uh, and then try to get some chances in there. So it was, uh, I think it was the kind of balance and in a way opportunistic defensive performance that, you're kind of used from Arsenal. And of course, against a different kind of opponent, they will be more proactive. They will be more aggressive here. Uh, they try to balance it out a bit more. And and one of the things is that even when they were defending deep, they still uh, had they still had some very good transitions against City, which is which is one of the things about this City team. They're not a rock in transition. And if a team, and as Sid mentioned, like a team with Arsenal's talent still did damage to them let's not even talk about real madrid and the quality and the quality that we have up front so there are uh, i'm not going to tell you that it's going to happen but real madrid definitely have the tools to do a lot of damage in these transitions leandro tosard man why didn't you square it at the end he was right there for the win he was right there and i was like Vinny. first of all he wouldn't slow down he would speed up he might just shoot it himself he's just so much faster um, I also thought Odegaard great defensively, very good defensively. But um, in possession, he was just not that threatening today. Um, he he struggled, made some pretty poor final balls. I'm watching Brahim and I'm like, if you give him the ball, he's just dribbling past guys. If you give him it to him in some of those situations, he's driving it. And same for Rodrigo. 
Arsenal, like I thought Jesus was really fun, what he did. Um, he, he, he tried, like he wasn't, it was nothing, nothing special in terms of what he created, but it was a good effort. Um, so yeah, I saw there was a lot promising. What do you think, Kian? A lot promising for you? We're going to beat them? I, I'm fascinated by the whole thing. To be, <laughs> You could have just asked me, what are your thoughts, Kian, and just left the question there. We're going to beat them, right? We're going to destroy you, them, Kian? Is you're fully optimistic, right? Like, this is everything you wanted to see, right, Kian? <laughs> I'm just cautious. I don't know, man. I Listen, I, I'm fascinated by the whole thing. I... First of all, I just want to clarify also where I am, not that anybody cares, on the whole spectrum of this was boring versus this was um, a chess match. Fascinating. I just think, like, it's okay, guys. Like, some people, like, were so butthurt, it seemed, about this idea that we, we, we didn't enjoy the game. It means we didn't understand football. Like, it. I think it's, like, I, to me personally – without having an opinion on how Real Madrid should approach it, how Arsenal should approach it, as a neutral tuning into Manchester City games, I just really, really enjoyed the way Liverpool played them because it's just way more fun for a neutral to watch. You can talk about whether that's the right approach or is Arsenal the right approach? That's up for debate. I just think it's okay to be like Arsenal defended really well, but this match was really hard to get through. It was hard to watch. And this is coming from someone who, like, enjoys defense and, like, what it brings to the table. And I can actually be entertained by good defense. It was just tough. I would have been interested to see how this match would have progressed or, like, if if we saw this, if we saw Arsenal versus City, like, over two legs like this, how it would have gone down. And would Arsenal have created a high enough volume of transition opportunities to give themselves a chance to win one or two nil? That chance at the end maybe confirmed that they it would have been enough, but I, it, it, it's interesting because Arsenal kind of did to City what Porto did to them, right? And I think Arsenal the way they defended today was actually brilliant. Like it was actually incredible. They gave City nothing. They played very narrow, and City like in those moments they rely on Rodri to break lines a little bit, like to kind of carry the ball through or to find something or to maybe even shoot or or find a a vertical pass and he couldn't do anything because there was nothing that Arsenal gave him. There was no outlets available, but I think the inverse was true. It's like the, it gave me bad flashbacks of the Etihad last season where Arsenal defended well, but then what, like you cannot, like Saka couldn't get any transition attacks. Like you mentioned that he was on an Island. You know, Vinicius, if we play like that, Vinicius is going to be in that same problem. Vinicius is a better player than Saka, but he's still going to have a lot to do in that situation because Arsenal were just swarmed. They couldn't put a pass together. They could not escape the counter press. So to me, both teams were kind of happy in that sense. Arsenal were happy because they were not conceding chances. City were happy because they were not conceding chances and losing the ball at all. And every time they did, they would just win it right back. And I don't really know what City could have done differently. It is interesting to see Holland in in moments like this and what he actually brings to the table. Because in my opinion, I know it's harsh. It's not much in these situations. Um, but I've seen people say like, "Well, we're not going to approach it like Liverpool. We're going to approach it like Arsenal, the way we approached it in the Etihad last season." But I think we didn't defend nearly as well as Arsenal did today in the Etihad last season, right? So I don't know what – if I, I'm not going to be at the Manchester City first leg. Lucas is going to be there. If I was there, I would ask Carlo, so you saw the Liverpool game and you saw the Arsenal game, which approach was more conducive like what, to, to winning? Like which one do you resonate with more? And I, I'm curious to know what he actually thinks. I think we're going to play in between. Like we have the attackers and we're going to probably – we might be down at points where we have to play more like Liverpool. And no, no – or at, at even game state or when we're up, if we can play like Arsenal, that would be great. Um, that's where Militao brought me so much happiness. I don't know if he's going to play, but, you know, I still think we need Chouameni at the six, and I think we need Militao at center back. I don't think Nacho can do what Gabriel did today, and Saliba and Gabriel were just phenomenal. In, yeah. In their um, yeah, I mean, De Bruyne got locked up. We can lock up De Bruyne, but, you know, if we, if we, don't, if we don't have our center backs ready to go, it's going to be scary. I think Rudiger is going to have a good time against Haaland. I could just feel it. Just watching him today, watching Haaland, Rudiger is going to get in his head. 
the myth of Rudiger shutting down big strikers will continue. I don't know if you saw, but someone had posted, uh, I saw on social media, City's record against the big six. Uh, and it's not great. Not great at all. And uh, I don't know, did, starting, starting to sound like Sid a little bit, drinking the Kool-Aid. But maybe they are they are vulnerable. Um, and look, they're beat up. And we just have such an amazing collection of talent to be able to do what Liverpool did. Again, like the problem is a little bit that, you know, Liverpool, are, it's, it's baked into their DNA to press. So it's much more cohesive than when we just when we decide to flip it on like a light switch. There's that. But I, I, I kind of agree with you, Sidden, that I think it is probably going to be an approach somewhere down the middle um, where it's not quite as aggressive as Liverpool. It's not quite as defensive as Arsenal. And certainly it would be, I think if he does that at home, it's going to be, uh, the Bernabeu will probably let him know. Um, we've seen the Bernabeu let our coaches know when they don't like defensive football. And I think the most extreme case was that game against Barca, in 2000 whatever it was 11 or something speaking of that it's so funny how like i saw jokes about how when Mourinho does it with madrid he gets booed when arteta does it with the best arsenal in a decade he gets praised i thought that was a little funny <laughs> because it's true <clears throat> there was some there was a case that look this is that was it was at the etihad today and now, I don't know. I, I didn't actually get a chance to watch the Ars the game that was actually in London. Um, was it different? No. Rodri was out, but it was the exact same game. The only difference was um, it was even same to the point where Arteta waited till like the last 10, 15 minutes to make his attacking subs and kind of let them loose. That game, it was Havertz who came on, won a second ball for Martinelli, deflected in. Today, Trossard came on and didn't, didn't square it. when he, The guy was wide open. I think it was Martinelli wide open on the right. So that was the only difference. If Trussard squared that ball, it would have been almost the exact same game. I think Arsenal had a little bit more possession. It's also very similar going back to the Community Shield. I watched that game too, where um, Timber was playing and it went to penalties. And it was 1-1. City scored late and Arsenal equalized late as well. All of them were almost the same game in many ways. I think this might be the one where Arsenal had the least possession. But in terms of nobody creating anything, they were all the same. Jose, I have a kind of an intangible thing that I wanted to throw at you. I mm -hmm. I think there's something that happens in, in games like this that's really hard to measure, but hear me out. I think you can kind of see it. And I think it's a momentum thing. When you defend the way Arsenal did today and the way we did at the Etihad last season, it's hard to put together an attack. And I think your attackers, in theory have better transition opportunities, but because they're so, uh, they have so much of their energy consumed on chasing shadows on defense and being so deep in their own half, it's actually difficult mentally to put together passes. Like their momentum compounds in the, the attacking and pressing team's favor. And it's hard for the team that's pinned to get out and actually put together the right passes in transition mentally. And I wanted to get your thoughts on that because that's what, something that I noticed, like just being at the Etihad last season, was that I really felt like the momentum with each pass, with each press, just kept shifting in City's favor. And our morale would just decrease with every pass and every time we lost the ball. And I wanted to get your thoughts on, on that. It's like a, kind of an intangible thing, but I, I, I feel it. I kind of felt it with Arsenal today too. Brilliant defensively, but they just couldn't find the right passes. Yeah, so that's an interesting idea on several levels because one thing that I think about a lot, one is the, the mental stress that's caused by you having to defend. So, or by you trying to get the ball off, especially off an opponent that's really good at keeping it. So, this is actually something uh, that was pointed out. Like there was this one tie that we played against Atalanta still under Zidane. I think it was like 2020, 2021 or something like that. Um, where uh, it was like Atalanta being a very good pressing team. 
uh, they really struggled. That was one where like Sidan C- did like one of his best tactical switches ever. I think he kind of moved the position of Nacho and then Kroos and Modric took over the game. And the players were re- uh, from Atalanta were really talking at about like it's so demoralizing to play against these guys when they just keep the ball and you have to be chasing it. So yeah. there is an aspect of that of like trying to get the ball against. Uh, a team that's really good at really good at it uh, at keeping the ball that demoralizes you, makes you lose confidence, and just makes it harder to both to defend, but then also to switch on when you get the ball and then try to attack. And I mean, that's one of the things where it's complicated to be kind of a counterattacking team because you really like you spend most of the time defending, and then suddenly you have to turn on a switch and then go into attacking mode immediately. A team that is mostly in attacking mode, like, say, a more dominant, like, Real Madrid playing against a weaker opponent in the league, Manchester City. Like, when you're in mostly attacking mode, it's a bit easier to have that... Well, you have that switch turned on all the time, but really flipping the defense to a the defense to attack switch uh, not that frequently, that does make your attacks, I think... A bit worse, and then there's the other aspect of uh, people. So, like, of course, there's always this complaint about this uh, this attacking superstar doesn't want to defend anymore. But it does have an impact. Like a player having to do defensive work does have an impact on their focus, on their concentration in attack. And this is this is a- actually a theory that I've always wanted to do, like some digging in the data about whether. Striker, do strikers that do more defensive work uh, have worse finishing? You could say that, for example, about Gabi Jesus, like a striker that does a lot of defensive work, or, or even Kai Havertz. It's like uh, people that do a lot of defensive work, and but then they're so tired by the time they have to get into a finishing position that the finish is not that good. So those little things have, have an impact. Doing a lot of defensive work... Uh, does have an impact on these things and on your ability to put together a good attack and to finish chances when you should. Yeah, I saw a good tweet about this where um, Raj Chohan, he's called it the um, Sobos Lie effect because um, Sobos Lie at Liverpool, similar idea, apparently his passing has dropped off. I thought Odegaard was very, very much knackered when he was playing some of those passes. He just looked dead on his feet. And um, yeah. yeah, I mean, hey, we got nine days off. I don't want to hear those excuses in nine days. It's playoff Pintus time. Like, we could, we should do it all. Um, I mean, I, I want think- Ancelotti to come out and just do the opposite, like completely cancel out what Carlos said and be at uh, what Pep said and be like, City have the ability to have momentum and match fitness. It's not fair. They have, they have so many games to prepare. We have zero. We have, I want him to go and like double down the other way and just cause a, a huge media war. It's I, funny because some of the data has shown before that too much time before a game can hurt. I just think this team. This season, with what they've been through injuries-wise, it's not the case. But I think you could make the case for that for some teams. Um, Isn't this a thing in the NBA? Correct yeah, me if NBA, I'm wrong. Um, like, one day off is optimal. Uh, any more than one, two and three, they show a dip in the NBA, correct? Well, well, the team like that gets to the NBA finals and sweeps everyone and has like two weeks until the, the they're waiting their finals opponent who goes to game seven? I actually don't know. I, I, for some reason, I thought I thought of this because I, I've seen people talk about this that like too much uh, lingering and no games is, can actually affect you in a different way. Yeah, yeah. The peak is after with one day off in the NBA, um, but you have to understand it is a broad study, so there are always contexts where it won't apply. But in this case, um, one day off optimal. Back to back games doesn't work too well. Um, two days off, slight dip. Three days off and larger. Apparently, there's a pretty large dip actually in performance. But again, it's it's very contextual. Like um, if you give an aging veteran like LeBron or like, you know, someone like Cruz, these guys who are a little older, who are quite experienced, I don't think it's um, nearly as damaging. Actually rested, for example, LeBron is known to be quite devastating when he's fully rested after like two plus days off before a game. So it really depends. Like um, I would argue like it's, it works that way because not every single player on the team prepares the same way. So a lot of guys, maybe they need that match fitness. But more experienced teams, more veteran teams. I know we're not a veteran team. We are a young team. Um, but I, I don't think it's going to, at least in this context, I don't think it'll work for us. But yes, Carlo could totally go and be like, 
in my career when we've had too much time off we haven't done well he could definitely go say some bullshit like that that would be funny um i want carlo to get into a war of words in the press conference too i want him to say something egregious like like you know pep just pep just loves making excuses or some pep loves drumming up situations i would love if he said that but we know carlo won't maybe he will i don't know maybe he's no he won't I, Pep is just such a cartoon character for me. I don't know what it is. It's just the way he talks, the way he, the yeah. way he says things. It, it's it's hilarious to me. You can you can he deals with a lot of things with sarcasm, but you can also tell like deep down he gets really annoyed and he obviously hates losing. And it's just it's such a cartoon character to me. Um, the point about Odegaard, I noticed that. I I think that was clear to me too. Like Odegaard. And this is kind of the struggle that Cruz had in some sense in stretches of last season where we were playing very defensive, conservative football. That was not Cruz's best stretch in his career, in part because he was asked to kind of run around and chase shadows. And this is also going back to 2020, 2021 range, like those games where we were playing very deep under Zidane in the Champions League against Chelsea, for example, like you want players like Odegaard and Cruz on the ball. And when they're pinned deep defending and that's where most of their energy goes, that's not them at their best. Um, I wanted to talk about just players that we have this season that we did in last season. And obviously the main guy is Jude. The other one is Brahim, who will probably come off the bench. But I wanted to make a point about Jude. If we're going to play in transition, which to me is probably the most likely scenario, I have full trust in Jude right now. I don't know what it is with him. Um, the kids call it aura. In transition, he is probably the best decision maker in the world right now to me. You know, obviously, I also think about players like Kevin De Bruyne when they have like open space like those guys are just devastating the way jude passes in transition the way he times his passes are devastating i just don't think we've had a player like that last season in part because benzema wasn't at his best last season so that that's one thing i would look at um i, I fully trust in him I, I don't know if you guys had any thoughts on that in particular but i, I just wanted to throw it out there as well i think what i like a lot about jude in these situations is that he could be having uh, the worst possible game and he was still going to show up. It, like A bit like what happened against Leipzig, right? That he was not having a good game and then he shows up that one, t- that one time on the counter with, with Vini and then that... Uh, and then that uh, that decides the game, and, and that's the th- and then that's the good thing. Like especially with Vini and with, and with Jude, they could be having a bad game against City, but they can still show up that one time and get that goal. Yeah, what were your thoughts on his performance today overall? It's some more normal Jude performance, and this doesn't because uh, there was a, there's a there was a bit of rumble like uh, actually in the chat of like oh Jude is not playing well and we're not demanding enough of it. Like first of all, we have to differentiate between Jude not playing well and Jude not scoring, which is not the same. Like yes. it's quite cl- it's quite clear that the second half of the season for Jude has been more of an enabler rather than being the guy at the end of the chances. That that's mm-hmm. one thing that should be clear. Uh, it is true that even if I see his game today from that perspective, it was a bit more quiet. The situations where you could see that he had more impact was either on those counters. It was in transition, like the counters or the situations where the team broke through uh, Athletic Express and then he had room to space to run. There are other games where he just has impact everywhere, everywhere in every phase of play. He has impact in possession. Like this time, it was a bit more quiet, for example, in possession phases. Although all, all in all, the team was a bit more quiet in possession this time around. Like there wasn't, there weren't many times where the team had, I I remember there was one sequence that, where the team actually managed to pass the ball around in Athletic's half. And there was a good chance kind of generating there. Like the team was playing well when it got to that phase but it just struggled to get into that phase, like in the final third 
to begin with, like for a sustained period of time. Uh, but anyway, so all in all, I do think it was a bit more of a quiet game from Jude, like not just from a more from how he played and how he participated in the game perspective. But I mean, this guy has been what one of our top like even when he's not scoring, he's been contributing a lot. So, I mean, Jude has been probably like one of our top three most consistent players, something along those lines. So can complain even if he has like a bit more quiet game. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree. Yeah. Nine days off. He's not going to be this quiet next game. I'm I'm fairly confident. Not at all. Even on the yellow, he's going to be vicious. I'm confident this is the quietest game from Jude. We'll see for the rest of the season. I'm declaring it now. It is the quietest game we'll see. And he, he just crossed 20 and 10 in La Liga. 20 goals, 10 assists. Top scorer in the league. Man, I can't even believe. I can't believe it. Like, it's. I can't believe we're in this position. It's March 31st. After the first match day when they tore those ACLs, to be here, to see Militao come back. Also, just random trivia, Militao's last three full games have been against Bilbao Professional, like um, the last game of the season before. Huh. <laughs> yeah, the game he got That's injured. That's crazy. Wow. Yeah, so um, Militao. Um, but yeah, so I think this is going to be Jude's quietest game for the rest of the season. That's my prediction. Well, what's interesting is that now, I mean, look, I, I want to speak for myself. I think most people would agree. This is the part of the season where, like, this is why I'm a football fan. This is why I'm a Real Madrid fan. It's for this part of the season. The big games, the apex of the season, the clutch. It's the the NBA playoffs of the regular season that we go through. And this is where I'm like, all right, let's go. But when I'm most nervous, when I'm most excited, and knock on wood, Oh man, I just is a. I'm gonna. I, I have to have like a button where I press where it like announces this. I'm going into Sid Hearthram Sundar mode now. I'm gonna put on my Sid mask. If there were if was ever a time to play City, it might be now. Like I know, like I, I know there's a train of thinking of like we should play these guys in the final. All things considered, in terms of our squad health and them missing players, whether you want to believe believe it or not, whether they're you know the severity of their injuries, whether it's as bad as they make it out to be. Uh, it, it might be the best time to face them. It might be. Them coming off a grueling schedule, missing some players. Our squad is pretty much all ready to go, apart from Courtois and Alaba. Um, it might be the best time. Uh, this is a super chat related to Militao. Zeppelin, thank you. He says, another Militao clean sheet, my center back. That's that's right. Another clean sheet from Militao. How many how many minutes did he play? Three. Wait, you don't give Nacho the clean sheet? I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's, it's just funny. It's just funny. It's come to this where we he plays three minutes and we're celebrating it because of how. So it's sad. It's come to this. You know, a couple a few. You know, remember Militao's? He first came on the scene when him and Nacho had to play together, right? Barani and Ramos were out, and it's sad that it's come to this. But yeah, I mean, really happy Militao played his three minutes. Yeah, going into that center back discussion. So in the end, how do we feel about the city game? So Nacho or Tramini as center back? How do we feel going into this one? Whew. Is there a pivot where we play Camavinga? I like I can see Camavinga, Fede, and Cruz doing enough defensively. I just think do you do you think Camavinga is going to be better offensively, or do you think he'll give it away? Because Chuameni, you know what you're getting. He's going to be reliable. He's not going to take too many risks with the ball. That's really my concern because um, I think Chuomeni is definitely the better center back. I mean, like I today does make it harder though. I mean, thank it's not really our. It, I'm glad it's not our decision. The coaching staff, what they see in training, is going to be big. But um, before today, it was clearly Chuomeni, but I was concerned about Camavinga and the in possession dynamics. After today, um, you know, I hate to say it, but Nacho gave me a little glimmer of hope, just a little like a tiny glimmer. But also just go watch Gabriel and Saliba and like Bilbao didn't test us that way. So it's like two different, balls. like watch the number of balls they cleared. From that perspective, I don't know if we have a choice. We kind of have to play too many. And, um, you know, my answer is Militao if we really could, but I don't know if he's going to be fit. Um, what do you guys think? I don't think, like, I think if, like, if Militao had played like a whole half of football, then I would be thinking about it. But 
I, I the fact that he just played three minutes here, he's not going to start the first. So league. he's going to so have I to play. That, so he's going to have to play in the remontada at the Etihad when he scores a hat trick from corners and we go to basically. That's also what I'm thinking. Like the goal is going to be to get him ready for the second leg. But like with what I saw today, he's not ma- he's not making the first leg. So the question for the first leg is really Nacho Tramini. I've always been very much we need Tramini in midfield rather than at center back. Then after like the last like what's has what's actually starting to make me like gaslight myself into having Tramini at center back in Camavinga in the pivot is the fact that I've liked Camavinga in the double pivot lately. And the, and then between that and what Tramini can offer you in terms of like winning aerial balls and winning duels for, uh, at center back, then after what I've seen, I could convince myself that you could go into it with, uh, um, with Tramini at center back and Camavinga in the pivot, especially in the first leg, like where you need to be a bit more aggressive, where you need to have a bit more of the ball, where you really, where maybe you can make a bit more, uh, like have some defensive trade-offs, but then take a bit more risks in the attack. Because uh, the thing, uh, but yeah, that's the scenario where I could imagine it. The main issue would be precisely what Sid says, which is that Camavinga is better, has a better line-breaking ability there, but he's going to take more risk. The risk of the turnover in a bad position there's a higher risk of a turnover in a bad position. Tramani is not going, maybe he's not going to have as much line breaking ability, but the passing is going to be safer and you're not going to lose the ball in a compromised position. So a couple of factors that will make it interesting. One, um, the yellow card situation might force our hand to play Nacho or like, because um, Chuomeni and Camavinga being on yellow cards means just probabilistically, if you don't play them both the 90 minutes, or if you start Chuomeni, bring Camavinga off the bench, more likely not. Um, at least Camavinga won't pick up the yellow. You start them both, there's a chance both of them pick up yellows. But um, the other thing is, I'm wondering how the in-possession shape looks with Camavinga, Cruz, and Fede. Because like, ultimately, you can't have all of them sitting deep. You can't have Cruz be the one who's further forward. So that means Camavinga or Fede needs to play further forward. But what if we did a throwback to 2014 and go Camavinga in the Di Maria role, where he kind of drives it up and down and... Cruz in the Zabi Alonso role, Fede in the Modric role. Um, that could work, like where Camavinga, because Mendy's going to be somewhat conservative that game, I imagine. Like we need him to lock up Bernardo or whoever they put out there. In which case, um, Camavinga would be really fun shuttling up and down the left, just as long as Cruz can stay intact in that pivot. You know, I don't want to see anyone bully him. I think he'll be good. I mean, on that note, like as you said, Jose, in your tweet, like man, Cruz was fighting today. It was he was jump like he was, even after you tweeted, he went up for this one big leap, and I'm like, damn, like he's jumping. We need that. We need him to like beat up Rodri. Like he needs to fight Rodri, punch him in the face. You know, he's uh, he's defend like he's just more just moving a bit. Like you know, like I, I love Cruz, but he's not exactly the most mobile midfielder, especially with like without the ball. So it's nice to see him go into these kinds of challenges. And like you said, like the, the team will need that against city. They need a version, like they need a version of Kroos that cannot be bullied uh, physically as easily. I, I'm looking at today's lineup and I just think this is what Carlo and today was Carlo's best 11 in his eyes. I think you have a yeah. nine day break. You have to win this game. There's nothing to save your players for. Kamavinga has been on the bench for two Classicos this season. He was on the bench today. I don't think he's in the Onsa de Gala. Personally, I think we're a better team when he's on the field. I don't think Carlo... I mean, I think Carlo believes in Kamavinga. That's not what I'm saying. But I don't think Carlo is has been able to justify getting him into the starting lineup over the players we have. Um. Part of the and, and something interesting that Carlos said after the game today that when he was asked too many or Nacho at center back versus City, he said, We'll see. But he also said, Too many did really a lot of important work in midfield today. And I, I think Nacho was good enough today, like you said. I mean, he had one mistake probably. I think this is probably what we're going to see against City in the first leg. 
is my guess. That's my bet. This plus, like, put Vini instead of Brahim, and this is the lineup. Yeah, that, yeah. Would be my, that would be my bet. The other argument to keep Kamavinga on the bench is that you get the Kamavinga boost as an impact sub in the second half. Kamavinga and Brahim, man. They're good. Like, Pep is going to be up all night having nightmares for this game. Kamavinga off the bench is an incredible game changer. Like, it's hard to think of a game where Kamavinga came in off the bench and didn't just change it or have something incredible contribution. So I'm not completely against it. I would just like to see more of Kamavinga. And I guess maybe that this is the reality until Cruz retires. It's going to be tough. Uh, I did want to make a quick point about City Arsenal. I know we're getting to the end of the podcast now. Because, Sid, you had mentioned er, like a few weeks ago about Grealish not, not being able to play against Real Madrid. Obviously, he's back. I thought he made an impact when he came in today. I, there was something just different about City. Like, well, that's he where... Ball, like, he's just, he just a very intelligent player and can just find passes into the box at a, just a different level. And I think it, him on the field is, is a bit of a game changer for me. He's well, a great player. What happened was um, they moved um, Rico and Guardiol. Like, Rico Lewis came on for um, Nathan Ake, who got hurt. And then they had Lewis playing. Akanji moved, I think, central, and they had Lewis up. Um, they just talked Lewis and Guardiol narrow. And instead of them being the ones crossing, they had Doku on the right, Grilish on the left. So that that's um, that's when Arsenal had less answers. Like, they still had enough. Like, it was nil-nil. City didn't create anything crazy. But... um. I thought the dynamic was a big part of Grealish making a difference, even more than um, just him as an individual. I thought just positionally they were – it was just more sound. Grealish isos are different because then instead of playing them one-on-one, Arsenal had to then double up Doku on the left, double up um, Grealish on the right instead of playing them one-on-one. So a little more space inside. You have to run around more. It's not as easy. Um, just my thoughts. But, you know, just to note, like they lost to Aston Villa last time. Um which I know it's a different Villa team. They've had some injuries, but they lost to them. And Crystal Palace, actually, it was 2-0 to City in December. And then Palace actually equalized in the 76-minute 2-1. And then they had Michael Olis scored a penalty in injury time. So those aren't easy games. I ended up doing another two-and-a-half-hour preview with Ali of the whole Champions League and City Arsenal yesterday. And I was just like, are they good teams? And he's like, yeah, they're no bums. Um, They're no bad. They're not weak. So... That's just something else that excites me for the city time. You know, I'm licking my lips. Maybe they drop points. I don't know if we want them to it's drop just points. like licking lips is, was not necessary two words to, to throw in there. Not necessary. <laughs> well, just think about it. Like, I mean, I don't know if I want them to lose, though. I want them to think they're still in the Premier League title race. So they need to, like, what would be ideal is, like, two games they win in, like, late, late at a time. Like, sure, you'd get the mental boost, but physically it's always draining when you have to remontada like that. So... Two games, maybe a bunch of added injury time, like, you know, a lot of goals. So there's a lot of up and down. That's what I want to see. I want to see City pushed all the way. But um, I am licking my lips, Keon. <laughs> Something totally out of left field, but I just wanted to ask you guys this. Did you guys see Lucho taking off Mbappe again today in the 64th minute when they were up 1-0 against Marseille and, and Mbappe's reaction? I he, was, he, was, he was really annoyed to be taken off. But I, my question is this. Do we trust Lucho to play Mbappe every minute against Barca and not take him off when, when it really matters? Are we sure? Are we 100% sure Lucho is not going to be like internally, like not admitting it publicly, but like, I love Barca. Maybe if I take Mbappe off early against them, you know, maybe maybe we can get away with a loss. Maybe Arsa can go through. I'll be happy. Are we, do I we trust so. it? I, I would trust, particularly for Champions League, I would kind of trust him on that one. And hey, he said it himself. Like, maybe they win all titles and, uh, and then Mbappe wants to stay. So that would, like, if he didn't play him, that would make that, that outcome less likely. I, I hope, um, I, I think the main thing we have going for us is PSG hate Barcelona. If there, there's like, as a club, they do hate Barcelona. They hate each other. The 6-1 really left a lot of wounds that will probably never go away completely until they win the Champions League. And um, 
and then they took Neymar from Barcelona and they took Dembele. So there's a lot of hatred there. If there wasn't that much history, maybe, you know, like it would be like another Atletico story where we just make fun of them, but they have that history and they are a defensive team. Um, one more note, Ali brought this up yesterday. He predicted nil nil for this game actually today. He was right. He also, um, I said one, one, I just who, didn't who predicted Ali. Yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't see it going no-no. I thought 1-1, so I'll give it to him. He got the dynamics right. Um, he also said Arsenal wouldn't press. And, um, yeah, he, he thinks, and I agree with this, with the way the ties are set up, we might see multiple penalty shootouts this round, like all the way. No away goals, just draws. Um, we could see our tie against City go that way, just looking at their offense. If we defend a little bit better like Arsenal, attack a little better, it could just be one ones both ways or something. Arsenal-Bayern can definitely go to penalties. PSG Barca, I know Barca are a mess, which makes it complicated, but in a cup tie, the way they'll play, that could also go to penalties. And Atletico Dortmund, I mean, it's clown show versus clown show. That could also go to penalties. Just a random thought. Um, it's I don't know how many how often we get these four ties that could really be defensive or even if not defensive, just not very high scoring, which is quite likely. Uh yeah. Uh, not to get ahead of like yeah okay I, I had some thoughts but I'm getting ahead of myself. Why don't we why don't we close with this? I have two rapid fire items with you with you guys. Um, do we have any thoughts on the referee? There was like two or three challenges on us. There was one really weird one where the Rodrigo was called for offside. The linesman kept his leg down, but the referee ran over to like overrule it and say, no, he's offside because it was a potential penalty. And then the replay showed it wasn't offside because the athletic player kicks the ball to Rodrigo. It wasn't Bellingham. Mm. That, and then I didn't the, think too much. Oh, go ahead. That and there was maybe a missed penalty or something that could, or Rodrigo got taken out once too. That could have been, I don't know about penalty, but it could have been a foul. And Jude, Got taken out once and got, got stood up pissed. I noticed those, but I don't have anything else to add. I just noticed them. What do you say, Jose? Yeah, like I noticed a few ones in the box that look contentious, but other than, I mean, I've seen worse. Let's just say that for the standard of Spanish refereeing, yeah. this was a quiet night. <laughs> this was this was the best refereed game in La Liga history, actually. That, that, that's where the standard is. Um, the, sec the last thing... Uh, any thoughts on the purple jerseys? Do you like them? Do you hate them? Not at home, man. I was I thought of Bilbao was us like for the first 20 minutes so many times. I just was like my brain was wired differently. Yeah. Um had to adjust to it. Yeah, just white at home, please. Anywhere else, purple's fine. I'm glad the greatness of the purple overruled the Y3 curse. Um, because we do not have great memories of the Y3 jersey. It goes without saying. Um all right, guys, I think we've exhausted it. Any concluding thoughts? I mean, we have now nine days to talk about Manchester City. So it's so we have that. Um, but if you guys have anything else, let me know. I'm um I'm just doing another I'm just doing a city preview tomorrow. Um so yeah, you guys want to do a city preview this week? I'm just kidding. <laughs> we've already done it <laughs> like essentially. Yeah, the last yeah. two plots have been a city preview. <laughs> I know it's so funny. I can't believe I did a two and a half hour pod yesterday too. It's been three straight days of me just talking about, and also City Arsenal talking about it three days in a row. Um, but yeah, I mean, any plans to bring on a special guest for City Preview, Kian? Um, not really. I mean, well, we have a, we have a special guest on Tuesday. He's not really a city guy, but he is a special guest. I mean. I think, look, we're on City Preview number 3,000. And this, this the title of this podcast now has to be changed to Atletico Postgame slash City Preview. And then there's going to be like City Preview tomorrow, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Thank God that City play like four more games. Yeah, so every time you have to iterate it, you know? Yeah, so like thank God, like the City Arsenal game at least gave us something new to talk about with City. And the Villa game will give us something new to talk about and whoever else they're playing. So at least they're playing enough for us to talk about their... We're basically going to have like four Manchester City post-game podcasts from now until the, the first thing, which is fine. Um, I'm okay with it. Like It's not like we have to watch Real Madrid. So I'll, I think that's the direction of the next few podcasts, to be quite honest with you. 
Um, so today is March 31st. I'm saying this because I'm reading the uh, Managing Madrid podcast schedule from now until the City game. Most of the next few podcasts over the next week or so, over the next nine days, are going to be for members only. So we're going to do live calls. We're going to do um, a lot of content for our members. Patreon.com slash managing. Alternatively, if you don't have Patreon in your country or if you're on YouTube, hit the join button underneath this YouTube video. It's super easy. You get the same content and we're going to be very active. So if you ever want to also talk to us directly, the best way to do it is become a member. I know that's a little bit hard to do otherwise in the chat or whatever. Um, if you want to actually talk to us directly and ask us questions, but also just get access to a ton of bonus content and join the ever-growing, amazing Real Madrid family that I love and I'm really proud of because the dialogue and the discourse is just way better uh, when we filter it out like this. And you guys join this ever-growing family. Go to patreon.com slash managing Madrid or join YouTube memberships. With that, we're going to sign off. Sid, thank you. Jose, thank you. Listeners, thank you. And... Uh, We'll catch you uh, for the Manchester City preview tomorrow, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Thanks, guys. Peace out. All right. See you, guys. <laughs>